What's up, everybody? You're watching From Prison to Purpose, and my name is Jimmy McGill. I am the host of the show. I'm an author and a public speaker on reentry and recovery. I am a person who has successfully reentered society after incarceration and turned my life around. I'm all of these things, most importantly, because I am a person in long term recovery from addiction. And before we dive into who our special guest is today, I want to say thank you to the American Business Engine for making this podcast possible. I got to thank the National Peer Recovery Alliance, and I want to thank Safe Haven Ministries and Next Step Recovery Housing. And today's guest is actually one of my closest and dearest friends. I have watched this guy fight and claw his way out of federal prison, state prison, and his journey takes him from federal incarceration to being the CEO of one of the largest treatment providers in the state of Arkansas. So this is going to be exciting, fun, and you do not want to miss this. Please follow us on all of our social media platforms. And without any further ado, JD, welcome to the show, man. What's up, buddy? Man, thanks for having me here, Jimmy. I'm glad to be here. You excited? I'm very excited. This is uh, one I like to watch you grow. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I'm a big part of that. Big fan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're here and not there, right? Absolutely. So with that, how long have you been clean, JD? Five years and four months. So you made a lot of progress in five years and four months. From a Walmart sack to uh, office. Ain't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah, it's mega crazy. From a Walmart sack to an office. What's That's right. That? How'd you do that? Uh, a lot of hard work, right? A lot of hard work. Not uh, uh, For me, it was about caring about people and not about money. My, my uh, reasoning changed in life. When it became about people, everything changed and everything fell into place. Yeah. So a while ago, you were you were talking a little bit about growing up. Tell, tell me what your early childhood was like, J.D. So I can remember back, um, I had a great family, right? I was adopted. Mother and dad loved me to death. Um, I knew my, uh, my real father. I was actually... Um, uh, my real father had three other children and, um, uh, got the babysitter pregnant, right? Mm. This was in 1966 and, uh, over a pool game. Cause he and my, my dad that raised me, they were, they were real close, man. I got the babysitter pregnant. Don't know what I'm going to do. Well, my mother that adopted me couldn't have children anymore. Dad said, I'll take that boy. We'll just play a game. So that's where my adoption came about. And you could do that in the 60s. Right? Yeah. So, um, so I was adopted at a young age. My dad yeah. was a pool hustler and an alcoholic and loved me to death. Right. But he had his own vices. So what, what was it like going to, where did he play pool at? You know, all up and down the north side on the strip, the green door, the circle J. You know, there were, you remember all those places. Yeah, the right? hideaway. The, the hideaway, real. yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's where he played pool at. And I mean, you know, he, he didn't really have a job. So what did you do when you were three and four years old and he was running around? So when mama, she would go to work, she worked 12 hour shifts, night shift as a nurse, right? Yeah. So she would go to work at seven, right? Work seven to seven. And dad would snatch me up and say, let's go. And we'd go off to bars. And they called them go-go bars back then, and the dancers were topless. They danced in these little tubes. So as he played pool, those were my babysitters, was topless women. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what was that like? Well, I mean, if that I mean I got all the attention. That's what I, you know, that's that's what I grow up uh looking for. I, you know, at three or four years old, that's all I knew. So to say you grew up on the titty, it's I, not an understatement. That's not an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. So do you think that it impacted you in any kind of way? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when it, when it did, I was always searching for attention. You know, um, uh, when I wasn't in the bar with dad, I was uh, kind of always with him. Uh, and then during the day, you know, um, uh, until I got into school, when I got into school, I, I still was, you know, searching for attention. It would, I'd start a fight or, or, uh, be a clown class or, you know, class clown. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of the, the thing I, I wanted the attention. 
Yeah, attention feels good, doesn't it? Oh, it feels good. Yeah, that that extra shot of validation. Absolutely. So, what was your um? What was the first substance that you ever abused? At well, the first substance that I took was acid. 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 I thought you were going to say alcohol. No, it was acid. So you just right. skip skip the gateway stuff and Didn't went he, straight to the hallucinogenics. Well, what happened was is is I was raised out in the country, and it was older kids down the street, you know, and my sister's 10 years older than me. Yeah. Older kids, they were, you know, 18, 19 years old. And I, th- I think I was 11, and I snuck out the window, heard the music, it was Ozzy Osbourne, I'll never forget it, back in the 70s. And I snuck out the window and went down there, and um, they gave me a hit of acid. You know, they thought it was going to be funny. And it, it was a trip. It was a, it was a trip. And uh, I remember my dad, uh, so I started doing that regularly. My dad uh, went in one time and saw that I was out of the room. He heard the music. He went down there, and, uh, and he whipped me profusely all the way back to the house. But, you know, that party scene and that attention – I wasn't scared of no whoopings. It mm. didn't. It. I still did it. Yeah. Yeah. So what was what was that? What did that acid make you feel like? So uh, I did it four or five times, right before I started drinking the alcohol, and it was like, um, you know, you would lose uh, uh, sight of anything. I remember seeing like dinosaurs and shit. You know, on your very first. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, was the dinosaur yeah. trying to eat you? Well, it was a, like a pterodactyl in the corner of the room, and it was an air conditioner. And it turned <laughs> into that shit. You so, know what I'm saying? So he's sh- and I'm like, Changing wow. shapes on you. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sh- shadows yeah. are playing tricks yeah. on you. Yeah. But it was, you know, even the, the few other times that I took it at that early age, it was just for attention because it was, yeah, I didn't really like it. I just wanted to do what they were doing. I don't know if I'd like it either if yeah. I seen... Yeah. Air conditioners turning into yeah, it was uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a trip. Yeah, yeah. Scary. So was it fun at all when you did it? The attention part was and doing what they were doing, but but I didn't really like I didn't really like acid. How old were you when you ate that acid? I was eleven. I think I was eleven, maybe maybe twelve. I was young. Yeah, very very young. So what came after the acid? Uh, alcohol and pot. Start smoking weed. My sister's. Um, her uh, husband at the time was pot dealer. He actually got arrested for like 100 pounds pot back in the 70s. Very abusive guy. I used to beat her. And uh, I would steal pot out of these big garbage bags. Mm. Yeah. What'd you do with the pot other than smoke it? Did you ever steal any and give it away? Oh, yeah. M- Attention. Mr. Popularity. Oh, yeah. Had to have it. With your stolen bag of pot. St- <laughs> <laughs> Had to have it. Had to have it. Yeah. 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 So you, yeah okay. So what school did you go to? Uh, we, well, I went to time. several different. Well, at that time, I went to uh, Bimito and then went to Jacksonville. When I turned, I think I was 12, maybe. Yeah. I went to uh, Northside in Jacksonville. Yeah. Did you ever sneak out and smoke a joint on the football field? Oh, yeah. Every morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember one time I was, my, in, I was in Northwood Junior High and uh, Mr. Jackson was on top of the portable buildings with a camera and I was out smoking cigarettes on the football field. And, yeah. and I was like, I wasn't smoking. And he's like, slams the pitchers. Down. Yeah. <laughs> like, Dang. Popped. Yeah. Um, okay. So what, 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 when did the harder drugs start? Uh, 14, 15. Um, uh, cocaine was the, the, uh, the next thing. And that's what took me down through there. Yeah. What'd that feel like the first time you did Coke? Shit. It was, it was my deal, right? It was my jam. What did it do Absolutely to you? Absolutely euphoric. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it, I didn't have to feel, uh, important anymore. I fucking was. Yeah. Right. And, um, and of course then I became, uh, the popular cocaine dealer at, at school. Where was you getting the Coke from? Am I supposed to say that on TV? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only a hundred years ago, JD. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the neighbor's kids. No, you stole it no, from your dad. No, I mean, no, no. Uh, my dad did not do any kind of drugs, you know. That's good. But, um, 
Uh, so I got it from an older guy that uh, his, I went to school, went to, went to school with his brother. And he's the one that said, Hey, I got this, I got this new thing. It's cocaine, man. It, you're going to love it. And he had gotten it from his brother, right? Yeah. He was 25, probably 30 years old. And you did love it. And I loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. So how old are you with your first interaction with law enforcement? Uh, 18. What happened? Um, it was, uh, I was going to the checkmate club. Yeah. I remember right? the checkmate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I knew the guy in there that, that, that let me in, you know, and, um, and it was pot. I got arrested with pot and that's where mom and dad come and got me, uh, from, uh, from the juvenile home hmm. or from, from juvenile court where they, they used to arrest you up on Plasky County. Yeah, uh, you know where they got. So the, you were eighteen, and they still mm -hmm. took you to juvenile. They still. That's where I went. No, I guess I was seventeen then. So yeah, because it was juvenile. Yeah, yeah. So what what was that experience like? How long was you in juvenile hall? Uh, maybe a week. It wasn't very long. Was you scared? No. Was there a bunch of kids in there? Yeah. Any of them try to touch on you? No, I didn't. <laughs> I never had that. You know, I always walked around. Uh, like I said, I would be a. a a class clown and start fights on in the elementary school. So you just and took always, that mindset to juvenile with you. Yeah, I always was kind of bigger than you know, stockier than a lot of kids, and 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 talk big shit. So yeah, okay. You had you, some scraps, but it wasn't too bad. Did you see any fights in juvenile? Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, kids are mean, huh? They can be. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have any feelings, any heart. They mm -hmm. don't care about nothing. Mm -mm. The worst place I ever did time was in the Division of Youth Services in Arkansas, the juvenile prison system here. Yeah. You can take all six trips that I've done in prison, boil them in a pot, and it doesn't come out to anything compared to how bad DYS was. It was horrible. Well, my worst was Varner in the 90s. Yeah. What was that like? That was that was bad. The early nineties, because I was 90s. there in ninety five, and I it was wasn't there, that bad. I was, it, I got ninety four. I was there from ninety four. Mm. Well, I was in and out because I had charges that were pending, so they'd take me back and forth. Stayed in Plasky mm. County from ninety four to uh, well, from ninety four ninety five. I was from Varner to Pulaski County, back and forth, back and forth. I was at Varner in nineteen ninety five. Shit, I, it, it wasn't nothing nice. I didn't see you there. Uh, you probably don't remember, Jimmy, because you're not that much younger than I am. Yeah. What barracks were you in? I had a couple of different barracks, but I want to say one of them was four barracks, nine barracks, <laughs> and then at Cummins, I was in 19 barracks. So when I got to Varner in, in 1995, the first place they put us was in one barracks. That was the short hair barracks. That was the intake barracks. And uh, from there, I think they moved me to... 13 barracks. Which host, was, I thought four was host squad. Well, four was punitive. Four was class three and four barracks was class four. That's where the knuckleheads were going. The people Maybe. Were, yeah. Now I, it might have, it might have been bad in, in those barracks. You know what I mean? From, uh, it took me two years to get out off class four. Yeah. It was constant fighting. I'd get out and I'd go back. I'd get out and I'd go See, back. See that? That wasn't my experience, man. That was not my experience at Varner in 1990. Now, they were telling all the stories about how bad it was. Uh, and when I got there, it just wasn't like that. Like, there was a lot of gang banging, but it were was. Were you affiliated? Then, yeah. yeah. I was not. Yeah, but I was, I was, there was only two white dudes that, that you know, there, there was no, there was no white gangs there back then. It was no. GDs, Crips, Bloods, and that, and it was Pyrus, it that was, was my issue. IGDs, it yeah. was. And so, but you were down. I was. I, okay. I was the, one of the few white boys from a predominant black neighborhood right. in, in the penitentiary system here. And and so when I got there, I mean, everybody knew me, and my yeah. my daddy had already been there for five years, and he was right. a real killer. You so, know, so you see where you might have it a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now in the feds, when I got to the feds, people knew me when I got to the feds because I kept my mouth shut. Yeah. You know, doing time in the nineties though was different. Like even even on even in hard yards where like what you're talking about, 
like the prison system was different. Like inmates, we were clerks. We had like, you know, if you get a disciplinary in the department of corrections, now you're screwed. Like that disciplinary stuck, it's going in a digital system. But back then, you know, dirty red was the disciplinary clerk. Right. You remember him talking? Pass it away. Everybody. Yeah. 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 So you give him a bag of coffee for $2 and 50 cents and he comes slide your disciplinary under the door to show you he pulled it. Yeah. So and, and so we were getting in trouble left and right and just pulling the damn disciplinaries. You know, and bank robber, he was the train the the tractor driver back then. And um, you know, you could there there was nothing I literally remember class I didn't have a GED. And so classification put me in uh half school, half host squad. Mm-hmm. And I literally paid uh, the classification clerk ten dollars to take me out of school and put me full day work. You yeah. know what I mean? So I yeah. could go outside. And, you could do that then. Yeah, you can't, you can't do, that, do now. that now. Yeah. So you think prison time was easier then or harder? Harder. But I still went to prison. You know, twenty years later, uh, the last time that I went um, uh, was two thousand sixteen. Yeah, and I stayed out for a long time and did really good and made shit tons of money, uh, legitimately. And then you know, drugs and took it over again. I lost everything. What? Uh, what's what's some? Tell me a crazy story about something you saw in Varner in 1995. Man, I had this dude. He was a big old dude too, man. Yeah, and he wanted he wanted to rape me, and he kept <laughs> listen. <laughs> I come through the child line, bro. Yeah. Dude, like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, big dude. 240, 250, big dude. White dude, black dude? Black dude, winking at me and shit. Blowing kisses at me. Was he serious or was he, he just was trying to? He was dead serious. They come to me in the barracks and said, man, you're going to do something with him because he's coming at you. And you know how it was back then? Yeah. Man, I've seen him. I've seen him skid him across the floor till the knees was bleeding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I ain't going. So we're going down the highway, and you know what the highway is. Yeah, the highway. Walking walking down the highway, and, you know, they spread the guards 20 foot, 25 foot apart. And I seen dude coming down the highway, and he winked at me. Make sure you talk. This is is a couple of weeks after all this crap started, and I thought, I got to do something. I just run across the highway, jumped up, grabbed around his neck, in my and around his waist and bit him on his cheek <laughs> and just kept tearing and ripping and tearing. And by the time I got done, a big chunk of that come out of my mouth. I split it on the ground and he is screaming, screaming. I just laid down on the hallway, you know what I'm saying? And let and they cuffed me up, took me away. I didn't have no problems with dude after that. No, nah, was now was that your first fight in prison? No, 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 no. I had many of them. What was your first fight in, in prison? Uh, it was over commissary. Tell me about that. Uh, they come in and just, I mean, they at first they were actually polite, like, hey, we're taking you shit. And I'm like, no, you ain't. <laughs> Dukes. Yeah. But then they come, they come at me two or three deep and, you know, you can't do nothing with that. So they kicked the shit out of me. I'm going to say this was one of the times I went in the hole. They kept me in there for 90 days. I took the, the old lock, put it in a sock. I can't hear you, J.D. You put a see. lock, put it in my sock, wrapped it around my my hand, and they was all sitting out on the road watching 38. Remember, yeah. that was the that was the deal back then. Yeah. And I just went to clocking. Didn't, didn't so did you, who go, did you go to the hole first, or is this after? This is after came? I got back out. So they came in there. They jumped you. They took your commissary. That's right. Went to the hole. Got back out couple days, wrap my hands up because I was quiet. Didn't say nothing. Yeah. Didn't have no commissary left. You know what I'm saying? So you sat in that, in, in isolation, that whole 90 days plotting on how to, plotting. you was going to get your get back. Yeah. Plotting. So what, what happened when you got them? Went back. To the hole. Yeah. 90 more days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did yeah. you, did you, I got, I got disciplinaries and stuff over it. You know, you yeah, that's why stuff. it took you yeah. two years on class four. You yeah. were doing stuff like that. I got yeah. one fight at Varner in 95. You're kidding me. One. And I started it with a, this tall GD name, uh, Proctor. Uh, and it was over the Mike Tyson fight. And there was a Mike Tyson fight and I had bet somebody a pack of Newports that Mike Tyson was going to knock this dude out in the first round. 
and Mike Tyson did. And so you know how it is when <laughs> oh, yeah. I got crunk, I don't want a five dollar pack of Cadillacs. And I'm yeah. like, you know, back then if you're smoking free world cigarettes, you you, you know, you, you you're somebody. You, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I always try to keep keep a couple of packs of Cadillacs on top of the cans of tops and buglers and all that stuff. And so uh he's like, Man, you don't get out my ear, you do you do you do you and I said, Man, uh, you know, I said what I had to say, and uh, he said, "Keep playing, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal on you." And I said, "We'll get you on, Punk." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, he took it on me. Took it. And when he did, I sprang up and just, you know, I, that was. I had always been nervous because I knew it was going to come down to me eventually having to fight in Varner, and that I knew that if it was somebody of the other race, I had about 30 seconds to handle my business before the police came in or I got jumped one of yeah, the two. Yeah. And so my daddy had, had pre gamed me about prison. He had already been there five or six years when I got there. And so he told me every breath you take is a swing that you can throw and you hit long, hard and fast and you don't stop until you have to stop. Right. And so I did that, you know, and so I just, and I'm walking the dog on this dude and he's like three foot taller than me, bro. And I, I done got, you know, when it started, he's way up here. And by the time I get him that corner, he's, he's down yeah, here. Yeah. I mean, I'm going off, you know, and, and I hear clack, clack, and it's, the keys turn into the barracks and, uh, uh, I, I could sense them. I could sense the CEO behind me and, and with his nightstick. And I just kind of threw my hands because I didn't want to get maced and I didn't want to get hit with a stick. And so I threw my hands up and they took me down the hallway. They took Proctor to the hallway and Tom Thumb was the, the captain then, you know, and uh, they called us in his office and he said, you know, Proctor went in first and he told this big long story of his side back then you know what I mean? They'd either whoop you, lock you up, or write you up, or whatever. And he said, McGill, what's your side of the story? And I said, Captain, I ain't got no side. I said, I'm white. You know I didn't start the fight with, with a black gang member. I said, I'm two weeks from going home. I've already made parole. What do I look like throwing that up? He said, get out of here. Yeah. And no sooner than, I, than that door shut, I heard, yeah, yeah, because he had this big bamboo stick that he used to. Remember the big bamboo stick he had I, it on his wall? Does. If you were in Barnard, you knew it. Yeah, he had that damn bamboo stick on his wall, and I knew that that he had took that bamboo stick off there and he had hit Proctor with the stick. And about 20 minutes after I got in the barracks, you know, I didn't even remember the fight, you know what I mean? But everybody was like, bro, I mean, when I walked back in that barracks, it was like a whole different atmosphere. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I showcased on him. Yeah, you know, and um, you got a little respect out of that, didn't yeah, you? Huh? yeah. And, and and my head, it hit different when I came back in the barracks. And about twenty minutes after I got in there, Proctor came in there, and I, I could tell that Captain Robinson had whooped the shit out of him. He went up. He didn't say anything to anybody. Walked straight upstairs and got in his bunk. Yeah, and just covered up and went to bed. Yeah. That was my, my, was my only fight in Varner in 95. You're kidding me. So, so before I went to Varner, I, I, I did almost five years in the feds, right? Before Varner? Yeah. Hey, I went to the federal penitentiary <laughs> in 1989. What was that like? So, um, man, it, it was, it was straight, right? Um, we had we had weight piles and Mr. Texas was my celly and the food was good. Who's Mr. Texas? I don't remember his name, but I can't remember his name. But that's why when I got to Varner, I was big as shit. Yeah. I had been running five miles three times a week. I was hitting the weight pile for three, four years. And I was a beast. You know, five foot nine, two hundred and thirty five pounds. Right? Yeah. Uh, in the best shape you could even imagine. I saw pictures. I went to a funeral last year uh, from a friend of mine that we were locked up together in the feds, and he had died of cancer. And you know how they do the the pictures that flow across the screen? And it was a picture of me and him with the penitentiary background. It must have been right before I got out and transferred over into to 
because I was big, bro. I mean, swole. Yeah. And that's that's the way I went into Varner. Was a stocky ass, hard as a rock. Yeah, dude. five years in the Fed yeah. joint. Yeah. So yeah. let me ask you something about federal prison. When yeah. when you went in in eighty nine, uh, did you see like is the sexual stuff happening in the USPs like it is in the state prisons? Yes. I mean, here's the way it is. They were giving it away, right? Yeah. There, there's there. You don't. I really mean, they see were giving it away, right? You had a different class of individual in federal prison than you did in state prison. I mean, it's what do you mean? Like a higher class of people? Well, like you had people that, that were in there for a hundred kilos of cocaine instead of an eight ball, (laughs) instead of an eight ball, you had people in there for 12 tons of pot. You know what I mean? I mean, you had, you had the real, the big shot callers. You did have killings and, and, and shit like that, but more so than not, the, the sexual stuff was, was you just had a lot of people in there that were gay. They, they weren't going home anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, they weren't going home anytime soon. Yeah. I saw a lot of it at Varner in 95. There was a lot of that, but there was no rape, right? There was no forced. No, I seen some forced. Yeah. See, I didn't see any of that. You know, I saw some intimidation from time to time. and and More of that yeah. than, than actual Force, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so well, I tell you one time though, my, my first experience seeing it, uh, is I was in an in, I was in one barracks, I was in the intake barracks, and the guy that was in juvenile hall with me for two years, uh, was there, and he had been in Varner for a year and a half, and he had fell in love with this guy that they called Mercedes, yeah. and Mercedes was a free world gay man. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'd heard all these stories about people using lips, you know, M&M and Skittles for lipstick. Listen, mm-hmm. if they're getting cell phones and eight balls in prison, they can get lipstick in prison. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this the guy that I'm talking about, he had, you know, he had all kinds of stuff smuggled in. So Mercedes had free world makeup and looked very girlish mm-hmm. to be in a man's prison. And uh, I got up one night to you know, to go use the bathroom and get a drink of water. And they had their racks, their bunks pushed together and made a queen size oh, bed yeah. right there in the middle of the barracks yeah. in front of it. And I was tripping. I was like, damn, they're just wide open with it. They don't care yeah. who's looking, who's seeing. Yeah. Like. I no, mean, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I was 18 years old and that terrified the hell out of me. I'm sure it traumatized me. Yeah. You know, and and then the next day, Mike. Did, I mean, I said his name. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <him. laughs> I don't know if Ty will edit that or not. Yeah. But, you know, I don't uh, edit that one. Yeah, uh, yeah, but you know, he, uh, you know, it just tripped me out, man. It was my first experience seeing that. Yeah. So, how long did you do in prison altogether? Uh, all, I call it thirteen. But it's like twelve years and nine months. Yeah. You might as well call it thirteen. So what, what changed? How did you go from sitting in prison to sitting in a CEO position? Um, so it started, and, and you know where it started. It started with you, right? So I would gotten out of prison, and, um, uh, you know, I had no intentions of using drinking or anything. But I got out of prison, and within four hours, I, had, I was lonely the attention guy. Right. So I called one of my old buddies and I said, man, stop by the liquor store and bring half pint. Let's sit and kick it. I'm out. I don't want no dope. Just bring me that, that pint of vodka and we'll sit and kick it. Well, he did. And it wasn't four hours after that. And I'm back at 12th and Taylor. I'm like, Hey, let's go get some dope. You know? So for me, uh, alcohol is a drug. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. Um, so I didn't report to the parole office the next day. Um, high for a week and, uh, um, I reached out. Right. And then Jimmy McGill shows up at my doorstep. So, uh, I got into the car, you know, I had to have some coaxing. I have character defects. Don't know if you want to talk about them or not, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Go for it. 
So Jimmy's trying to get me in the van. And I'm like, man, I, I got, I got shit to do. I got things. I, I mean, I got things to do. And Chelsea goes, Hey, KD. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she goes, you've only been in prison for a week. You don't, you don't have anything to do. Just get in the van. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, my character defects, all the, you know, that's a whole nother story about those. So they got me in the van and, uh, they took me to uh Quapaw house. Of course I threw a fit and I don't have anything, uh, got no underwear, no socks, no nothing. And Jimmy says, we'll buy you what you need. Yeah. And, um, that's where my journey started. Um, and Jimmy was, he was telling me, man, it's this new thing, peer support. And I'm working for Kirk Lane. And I'm like, you're working for the police. Yeah. And he was like, not like that. <laughs> you know, he was, he had just gotten the job maybe three months earlier. Yeah. And he was the first, right. And, uh, I guess I might've been one of your first little guinea pigs that you worked on and look what, look what turned out, you it's know, crazy. Uh, so I listened, uh, you know, I would call him and say, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And he would bump and guide me and nudge me and tell me what to do or give me suggestions and have me make my decision. And if it was wrong, he would say, are you sure you need to do that? You know? So peer support was, uh, was a major role in, um, in me getting where I'm at today. And that's where my career started at was peer support. Yeah. So what does your life look like right now today? So today, um, I, I'm the director at natural state recovery centers, um, 52 employees. Um, we have a full medical detox, male and female residential, all the IOP, PHP, everything under one umbrella is what Natural State Recovery Center is, recovery housing. And um, what it looks like today is uh, extremely busy, um, helping one addict, one alcoholic at a time, and it's turned into thousands. Yeah. So what, what's your favorite thing about your personal recovery? Wow. My favorite thing about my personal recovery, it has got to be the passion that a God of my understanding has instilled in me. That is my most favorite thing. I love people and, and, and to be able to help them find a new way to live is the most rewarding thing that I could ever imagine. Yeah. And that's my favorite. What's, what's been some of the challenges that you've seen coming out of prison and working toward being a CEO? Stigma is, is, you know, one of the biggest, biggest ones, but you know, this whole peer, peer movement, um, uh, it has helped, uh, break down stigmatic situations. Um, it's really been, uh, it's been phenomenal. The peer movement has. So, with that, um, you know, uh, the challenges in the first couple of years was COVID and the employment market mm -hmm. and, and having to reach and grab and just hire anybody that would look like they wanted to work. Right. So, uh, employees employment, um, has been the hardest challenge, uh, I think over the last, I guess, almost four years I've been doing this three okay. and a half, three and a half years. So what's, uh, what's some of the things that you would do in addiction to get and use drugs to do what now? What are some of the things that you would do in your drug addiction to get drugs? Mm. So there's not much that I hadn't done except I, I guess sexual favors. You know, I, I haven't done you, that. You don't think you were handsome enough to be a prostitute? <laughs> well, I used a lot of women, right? But I never did men. Well, right? that's still so, sexual favors. Jody. Right. Well, okay. So, so sexual favors of the opposite sex. I never, I never did that, okay. it, which to each his own. It's not me. I don't judge anybody. Yeah. But I, I did use, I did use a lot of women. So what's some of the things you do in your recovery for your personal recovery? Uh, 
you know, the things that you and Narcotics Anonymous has taught me, right? Yeah. And that's pray, meditate. Um, I need to call my sponsor more, right? Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, I go to meetings regularly. I'm constantly, constantly talking to people about recovery. Yeah. What's some of the biggest challenges that you've had to work through to stay clean? Uh, so as far as challenges go to stay clean, here's what it is for me too. After I got, after, after I started listening more in the, to you as my peer, um, I understood consequences and I was not going to put something in my body, be it alcohol or a drug that would send me back to prison. I understood that I was either going to die in the streets or I was going to die in prison and nothing would, uh, would I do to put me there? Nothing. Yeah. Relapse isn't a part of my recovery journey. Um, because I don't, I'm not going to allow that. Right. There's a lot of people out there that it is, and it just is part of some people's story. Um, if you're tired of going to prison, you won't use drugs anymore. Yeah. You know, that it makes me think, I hear a lot of people say that relapse is part of recovery. What do you think about that saying? I think that they have reservations, right? Um, relapse doesn't have to be part of someone's story. If you're done, do what's necessary to stay clean. Yeah. And I don't care which pathway it is. All the pathways have certain boundaries and rules and things that you have to do to maintenance your, your recovery. Mm -hmm. And, and you have to be willing to do that. If you're not, then you're, this is just my opinion. If you're not, then you're, then, then you stand a chance of relapse. No, yeah. I, I don't want that in my life. Me either. What is one of the big aha moments that you had after coming home from prison when you looked up and couldn't believe where you were at? I have those aha moments all the time, Jimmy. You know, uh, I have a wonderful, uh, partner, uh, fiance. And every time I look at her beautiful face, <clears throat> I have an aha moment, right? She's in recovery as well. And, um, uh, that, that's one of them. I, I can't believe where I'm at today. Um, I look back at the journey that I've been on and the people that God has put in place right, uh, is nothing short of phenomenal. And, and, and I have a lot of aha moments when I sit and think about you or Kirk or, um, you know, Jared Harper or Tom Fisher, some of these, you know, Tom Fisher remembers me from the streets. Yeah. When he right? was DEA agent. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I, I, I look at all of this and I'm just, a lot of it is aha for me. Check that out. Yeah. What's, uh, what's some of the crazy stuff that you see being the director of a treatment center? You ever see any just like, man, I'm glad I ain't high no more. <laughs> I do. I do. And, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sad, but real reminder. Right? Yeah. I, I can say that drugs have evolved. I never tried to lick my ear or chew off my toenails. Me or, either, man. <laughs> Hey, look here. Some of that stuff they got going on now. Yeah. I don't see how they could contort their body to do some of the things that they do. That flock and, uh, Whatever. I mean, yeah. I see them on that. What are you doing? You know, I mean. The dope's it, different, it's man. It's different. They grow it in, they grow it in, uh, in ice chests and on copper tubes. You know, they grow it and, and it's not. It's a fungus. It's it ain't a even, fungus. It ain't even lab grown. It is, it is a fungus. <laughs> And some Bro. of the stuff that I see people do is just like, wow, you know, I will never, it's kind of like the acid. I really didn't like it. I only done it a few times, mm -hmm. uh, you know, four or five times, but, but this dope that I see people on now, I'm like, shit, I ain't never touching nothing like that. And then the fin. Yeah. You know, yeah, the fin. I, you know, I don't want to start crying, but they're, I, I, I care about people. Right. And, you know, when I was a peer, I allow people in and I get into them. Right. And, and I want them to pick their pathway and to do all the things that I've done and just listen and, 
And then, you know, I, I have an instance where, and I hired him and he worked for me. Right. And, and he got sad one day, uh, over a deal with his, uh, ex-wife not letting him see his son. And he had been clean for six months and things were good. Right. And, and he went and he used, uh, on his birthday one time, mm, Justin, and he died. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, that's a uh, sad story. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, you know, I, I get close to people like that. Um, when I, when I was, uh, you know, working as a peer, I, I would get close to them and I went to many funerals and some of them I helped when they were a baby because they were friends of mine, their children, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's really sad. And I talk to people all the time. I go in every morning and I do it at noon and I go in at night into the center. And, and I talk to people about where I'm at, how I'm here, how I sit in those chairs how I listen to peer support specialists to get me where I'm at today. And if you don't, then you are risking death. 50% probably of meth has fent in it now is what I'm saying. People come in and say, I've never done fent in my life. Well, it's in your system. Okay. Yeah. They're mixing it. That's why you're sick. That's why I have to put you in detox. Right. Yeah. I bet you within 18 months, a hundred percent has it. Yeah. It's ridiculous at how, fast they're doing this yeah now how many beds is your treatment center we have 54 um we have we have um 18 males 18 females and 18 detox beds i'm fixing to increase that to 54 residential beds and 12 detox beds yeah so i i would assume you know our the population that listens to this show are a lot of family members, a lot of moms, a lot of dads, a lot of grandparents who are always trying to help get their loved ones some help. Or, you know, the the guy who, you know, I mean, we, we have a large following. Mm-hmm. And so for people who are listening and watching, how do they go about getting into natural state recovery centers here in Arkansas if they need help? So you can go to naturalstaterecovery.com. Uh, it's a simple process. It takes about 15 minutes to fill out the application. Um, our admin team will call you back, if you, you know, the next business, the next morning uh, after 8 o'clock. Um, if, if you get it done during the daytime before 5, they mostly call you back same day yeah. and do the assessment, and then, um, and then we will uh, we'll get you in. Um, our program is not 30 days. You know, a lot of people, you know, think – go for 30 days and, and, and you're cured. And that is not the case. Yeah. You know, there is no secret sauce that you can give someone in 30 days. Uh, our program's 120 days, right? And then we want you to stay, um, uh, in Kim, in the recovery house for up to a year. Yeah. Right. And where the rubber meets the road is after you get out and, and you start doing PHP and IOP and OP and, working with the peers, that's where the, that's, that's where the changes really start. Yeah. And you guys have a lot of people in personal recovery that works for natural state. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, um, I, I believe and a lot of this started with you, Jimmy. Um, I believe that, um, uh, you can, when you walk into natural state, you're walking into people who know how you feel, why you feel that way. Because they did too. Yeah, there's right? there's a passion that people who have survived the flames that that are engulfing you, when they've already survived that same fire, there there's a passion to want to help you that doesn't exist. If you, it's an in depth, more in depth understanding that makes us want to help people. And I tell people that all the time. Like people in recovery have a deeper appreciation for life, and we can't wait to give back because we we fought and clawed and kicked our way out of hell to get the life that we have. Right. And so natural state is, is definitely a leading treatment center provider in Arkansas. You guys have some real cutting edge stuff too. You do some stuff that a lot of treatment centers don't do. You want to talk about some of that? So, I mean, one thing is, is 
out of the 52 people, I think 37 of them are in long-term recovery. You know, that's a, that's a big deal. Nobody else is doing that. Yeah. 30, um, 37 of your 52 employees are, yeah, are in long-term recovery. And, and I mean, that's, that's from admissions to text to, uh, you know, I don't want to put everybody's anonymity out there. You know what I mean? But yeah. a lot of people, uh, work for natural state and that's inpatient, outpatient, doesn't matter, uh, right. are in recovery and understand. Now you're the CE, you're the director of natural state. That is correct. And Grant would be the CEO. He would be the owner. The owner. Can we just yeah. take a second to talk about your owner's hair? <laughs> oh, sure. Hey, <laughs> I have known him, uh, for when I first got out of, out of prison in, in 2000, and I wrote a business plan and it worked. And Grant was a drug sales rep. Uh, he was 28 years old. And you think his hair now, he had this whole, what was Mike Tyson's? Uh, Don King. Don King. <laughs> he had this whole Don King thing going on. Yeah, Don King. Yeah, yeah I, I'll never forget it. And we built a relationship, uh, a really good one, 20, 24 years ago. And then he was my banker. Right. Yeah. In this trucking company, we had a whole other thing. We didn't talk about that, but he was my banker. Right. And then I went off the deep end and, and lost everything. And then here I run into him, uh, when it, Kirk Lane had asked me about, you know, I know these people that are going to open this, they're looking at buying this treatment center and you got a business background, your workhorse, your peer, let me introduce you to him. And I'd be damned if it wasn't Grant. Mm-hmm. You know, go God, right? Yeah. All right. That's cool stuff. So what is, uh, for the listeners and the viewers, Yeah. what would you want to leave them with? Man, if, if you or a family member is struggling in addiction, natural state is there to walk with you just like it, it was done with me, right? Through the whole process. And even after the immediate process, the early process, we still will walk with you. I have 3,000 contacts in my phone from people that still reach out to me that I reach out to periodically. We care about the end result of your recovery. And, and just reach out to us. Let us help you. Let us help your loved one. That's good. What would you say to the moms and dads who, because earlier on the show, we had somebody talk about parents that enable. And he said, you know, when you give us money, you might as well be giving us dope. What What are your thoughts on parents who provide for their children that are in active addiction? Okay. So, so I agree with that uh, to a certain point, right? So, um, I, I've, I've worked with, with, with parents just like this. Right. And I bring in the individual, work with them as a peer, get them through treatment. That family does not need to provide cars and, and different things like that in early recovery. I'm working, I work with some that are, that are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, um, uh, that individual, male or female, needs to learn how to live on their own, right? And through peer support and through recovery residences, recovery housing, they can learn how to do that. You know, I, I had a guy that was, parents have houses in France and Greece and Germany and all over the world, 10 different houses probably. And uh, this guy had never had a job and he has a job today and has his own child and his own place to live and a wife. Um, that family stopped enabling him and started listening and they helped him. They would call me and say, Oh my God, he's doing so good. I, 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 how can I help him? Okay. Give him a down payment for a car, make a car payment for him just anonymously. Do something simple, but don't tie anything to him where he's got endless money. Don't give him credit cards. Don't do things like that. Yeah. You can help them at, like when, when they move into recovery residences, help them with 
uh, rent until they get a job, mm-hmm. you know, because the light still has to be paid. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. What about the parents who give their kids money that are still getting high? Well, they, they need to stop. Yeah. You're going to love them to death if you do that. Yeah. My mother did the, did that with me. My mother has money, right? Uh, but when she, and I manipulated just like anybody else would. When you want to get high, you do what you want. You asked me earlier some of the things I did for drugs. Shit, I stole everything. You know, I, uh, if I robbed your mom and daddy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. I because I did all that shit. And then finally one day, uh, mama said no more. Right. And that, that I still went to prison, but that's okay. That's part of my story. I had to do it. You know, I was living on the streets, yeah. robbing and stealing from people. Mom wouldn't give me any more money. So finally I went to prison. I've known Jimmy McGill for a long, long time, but you came into my life and clean, yeah, clean and shit. That still amazed me still does. But, uh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and learning how to, to do this with somebody like you, peer support specialist, man, it, it works. Yeah. And we see their bullshit too. Yeah. We can call it. Quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We call it quick, man. We call it quick. Where do you see the recovery community going with the next year, 2024? Because <coughs> Arkansas has kind of got this reputation of being the vanguard for recovery and reentry. Um, are we not? We are. I mean, we are. We're kicking ass. We're, we're, I consider us to be national leadership for reentry services, recovery support services. Um, and I think there's there's this surge of energy in Arkansas that people in recovery are so proud to be recovering yeah. people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just curious what what do you project what what do you predict 2024 is going to do for us? So 2024 now I'm looking at natural states point, mm-hmm. right? And and the population that we are serving which is, you know, it's it's the 12 step base. I, I think that 2024 for natural state will be stellar. Last year was a great year, right? Uh, do we make tons of money? It's not about the money. It's about the people. You know, I scholarship and give away till I get in trouble. You know, I want to help as many people as I possibly can. Yeah, me too. And I think that 2024 is going to bring a lot of, of healing and uh, a lot of saved lives. Um, I, I already see a little bit of a change in the fin. Uh, some of the younger people that are coming in, they're coming in scared now. And it wasn't two years ago. Now they're coming in scared. Yeah. Which when you can make them cry or you can make them think about life and death, then you've made an impact. I got a 20 year old in next up right now. Yeah. Young buck. And he's, the third 20 year old I've had in the last month or two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a few more. I am. Yeah. Which is good. We're trying to, you know, save a generation. It's crazy, man. You know, we were talking earlier about the dope being different, you know, that like I grew up in the, you know, my drug use was in the early nineties and two thousands. Right. And the dope was just different, bro. Oh, like, P2P. Yeah, I've read phosphorus. Everybody, yeah. everybody in Arkansas was cooking methamphetamines. We couldn't sell any to anybody, but we were trying to pretend that we were these big dope boys yeah. and we were just all cooking our own dope. Cooking and, our own dope. And so yeah. we, everybody had their own sack and you couldn't get rid of it. You couldn't give it away. Yeah. You know, and but we would do the dope <coughs> and the meth we were doing. We would tear brand new TVs apart and try to put them back together. Yeah. We thought we were porn stars. Yeah. We 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 took everything we could take apart and tried to fix it yeah. brand new, you yeah, know? Absolutely. They hit the pipe and they don't know if they're going to live or die. Mm-mm. It's literally rolling the dice. Like, and their, their bodily actions. It's, it's, it's air nuts. biscuits. I, like, mean, why? It's I am so grateful to God every day that I don't have the symptoms of perma geek. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you didn't have that in the eighties or the nineties, 
or the early 2000s. Yeah. But for the last five, seven years, everything has changed. Yeah, head on a swivel. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Drugs have evolved. Treatment has has to evolve with it. Yeah. You know, detox protocols has to evolve. Um, I like the 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 uh, co-mingling, I say co-mingling, faith-based and and 12-step based programs, you know, faith-based is finally getting some money now and they never got it in the past. Right. Uh, that's a pathway that works. And, and yeah, and, a lot of people get clean through their faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a 12 step guy. That's what, that's what you told me to go to. And it worked. And I'm afraid if I don't do this, yeah, that it'll stop working for me. Now, do you support multiple pathways of recovery? Absolutely. Right. So, yeah, me too. Me too. I don't care if it's A-A-N-A-C-A-C-R, Buddhist, what, it doesn't so matter. Zone, As, it does, yeah. MAT services, yeah. that's something that's going to be uh, um, big. And it's growing. You know, it works. We, we have MAT services as well. Um, we're fixing to do a, uh, mm-hmm. fixing to open a uh, Spock Zone uh, MAT clinic mm-hmm. um, at our new outpatient facility. That's good. Yeah. Well, man, is there anything that you want to leave the listeners and viewers with? Man, if you need help, reach out to Natural State. That boy, right? That boy plugging that business. I'm plugging there. that business. Hey, that's all right. Get Here's with, the deal. Get, get with me after the show. Hey, it's, hey it's we'll work passion. something out. It's the yeah. passion for the people. Yeah, what it's for about. Sure. You get them in. Well, JD, I want to. I want to first congratulate you on the life you're living, man. Not many people can say they they went from sitting in prison to being the director of the largest provider in the state of Arkansas for treatment services. So it sounds like you really went from being in prison to being in your purpose. And so I want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to thank you for always supporting next step for supporting Chelsea, me, uh, and anything from prison to purpose can ever do for you. Don't hesitate to reach out. We, uh, we fully support natural state and you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, man. All right, bro. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps it up. Thank you. You've been listening to From Prison to Purpose with Jimmy McGill. Please subscribe on any of the major podcasting platforms and on YouTube at Prison to Purpose. This podcast is produced by Ty King with American Business Engine and executive producer Jimmy McGill. For more information, visit us at jimmymcgill.org.